This is Writers on Film, the only podcast dedicated to books on cinema. Hello, my name's John Bleasdale, and I am a writer and film critic, and today I am going to be talking to Philip Gwynne Jones, a crime novelist of a series of books set in Venice, starring a, or featuring, I should say, the honorary consul Nathan Sutherland. Uh, they're all super books and uh, well recommended, but the reason I'm talking to, to him is that he's also a passionate lover of vintage horror cinema from British Hammer um, all the way through to Italian uh, Jali. So we're going to be talking about that. We're going to be doing something slightly different as well. At the end of the episode, I've also added some of my sort of roving reporting, if you'd like. I had an opportunity to go to the film festival in Tromsø in Norway. And uh, while I was there, I asked uh, a couple of people for their recommended film books and I recorded their responses so I'll introduce each one and uh, you'll be able to um, enjoy those at the end of the episode. One final thing, I made a slight mistake during the conversation and I just wanted to point it out to you because I think it's funny uh, and I don't want you to miss it. <laughs> I was referring to Alien and I wanted to say Tom Skerritt, but I've got something like, you know there's such a thing as face blindness? I think I've got name blindness. I really struggle remembering and pronouncing names correctly and I often get them mixed up so I that's all to say I did or or, or I'm stupid that's the, that's the other possible solution so so I didn't say Tom Skerritt I said Tom Selleck which it's you know there's a missed opportunity there I think anyway if you enjoyed the episode please remember to like and to share as far and wide as possible you can follow me on twitter at dr john t d r j o n t y but before you do any of that please Enjoy the conversation. Oh, well, initially, not Venice per se, but back in the 1990s, I worked for a few months for the European Space Agency in Frascati, which kind of sounds like the coolest job ever. And, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, I beams glittering off the Tannhauser Gate and things like that. But it, it, yeah, it wasn't. It was. I was compiling a list of universities and um, universities who subscribed to various publications that that the space agency put out, and it was nothing more than that. That's when I first came to Italy. Was via IT. We came to Venice because we both lost our jobs um, during the economic crisis. Yeah, my wife and I, we were both working for the same bank, one of those banks that was sliding out of business. And uh, we both lost our jobs around about the same time. And I met a man in a pub who told me about this thing you could do teaching English as a foreign language. And I thought, well, you can do things like that? He says, yes, you don't make much money, but it's a, it's a living, you know. And so I went back and said to Caroline, um, a man in a pub has told me about a thing called teaching English as a foreign language. And I thought she was going to say, oh, yeah, put more water in it next time or something. But, um, <laughs> but she actually said, no, we could do this. We could do this, and we did, and that was ten years ago now. And that's around about the time that I started writing, I suppose. Right. So, uh, and and that's when you moved to Venice as well, like ten years ago, right? That's right. Yes. Yeah. Ten years in March, incredibly. Yeah. Wow. How do you find teaching? I really enjoy it. I mean, like many of us, I suppose I started off doing the private language school thing, where you'd be teaching business English or adult classes or tiny children and things like that. Now I mainly work in the state school system, and kind of suits me better. It's a lot of fun, usually. I mean, I'm teaching in an art school at the moment, and it's great because there are kids there who will talk about Hitchcock and Kubrick and, and things like that, which is tremendously, tremendously entertaining. I've taught for about, oh, it's going to be coming on 20, 25 years, maybe. Right, yeah. And I find it endlessly fascinating and, you know, and inspiring. It's just like, if I ever... Yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, I'll just get by on adrenaline and it feels creative. You have to think on your feet. You have to improvise at times. And it's everything that computer programming um, it was not, basically. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> lots of human contact and lots yes, of... Yes, yeah. 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 And in Italy, you're, it's a little bit like a cross between a social worker and a, a sort of you know camp entertainer as well. There is a lot of that, yeah. And I think, you know, um, there's a certain curiosity value. Like, why is this middle-aged British guy coming and talking to us 
in English all the time. And so there's kind of a natural curiosity there that this strange foreign bloke is in our class. What, what are we going to do? So and that, that's quite fun as well. Yeah. And so you started on like your your series of novels, uh, which I've read. Which one have I read? I've read one. The Venetian Game. Yeah. Yeah, that was the first one. Yeah, that was the first one. It was my first book and my wonderful agent managed to sell it. And that came out um, nearly five years ago now. Mm. And where the sixth book in the series comes out in July, which is uh, The Angels of Venice, got a contract for a further two. So it's it's um, it's taken off in a way that I couldn't really have imagined and possibly my publisher couldn't have imagined either. What was the sort of inspiration for you writing those books? Really, I mean, when I was teaching mainly adult students at the time, one of my students was the honorary consul for Thailand. And every lesson i'd arrive with a lesson plan and he'd say no no philip we can't do that today um i've got a problem with somebody's lost their passport or maybe they've been in trouble with the police and i thought wow what a job this would be Mm. um if you were writing a thriller series you wouldn't have to make you know your protagonist a cop or a private detective somebody in a job like this people would be coming to him with problems all the time and that seemed like kind of interesting yeah and the other inspiration was going on a visit to, um, I think it was the Banco Popolare in Campo San Luca, where they have an archive, various precious maps, books, artworks, etc. And I remember the archivist taking down this tiny little prayer book, which was supposedly illustrated by Bellini. And he told us about how he brought it back from Budapest in his jacket pocket next to his heart. And it just got me thinking about something so tiny, which could be so valuable, that could just be slipped into a pocket. Um, so just the city itself, really, walking around, it is just an inspiration. I, I think one of the things I really enjoyed about reading the book was the because I know Venice very well, I was a little bit cautious when I was reading it in the sense that I've just come back from, okay, this is slightly tangent but it does come back. I've just come back from Norway and we I had a great time there. And I was saying, you know, I'm really pleased because I was really worried that I'd been, you know, Nordic noir to death at some point. Yeah. You know, there'd be some sort of... <laughs> and they were like, yeah, no, but there's no crime here. There's literally no crime here. <laughs> and I sort of, and I was I was so relieved when I was reading your book that at one point you say, there's no crime in Venice. It's just not that. You, you didn't sort of invent this ultra criminal sort of world, you know. Exactly. You have to do it. I mean, Colin Dexter did it with Oxford, you know, in another city where there isn't really much violent crime. I mean, so I've been in Venice for 10 years. I think there was one murder about five years ago, two guys at a fight or something like that. But, you know, it's a remarkably safe city to walk around. But I do remember getting lost one night, um, walking home and just walking down this narrow calle and then realising it just ended in a blank wall and thinking, what would I do if I turned around? And I saw that little red figure following me. And <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's an incredibly safe city, but there are times where you just think, gosh, what if I hear footsteps behind me or something like that? Did you know much about the city before you came in terms of like the, your cinematic imagination? I mean, obviously Don't Look Now, you've just referred to there, is probably the best known of those, uh, uh, of those portraits. Yeah, probably Don't Look Now is the only one I've seen. In recent years, I've discovered there's quite an interesting little sub-genre of Italian horror set in Venice. Um, mm. There's a very good one called um, Chi la vista morire, Who Saw Her Die, which is quite a quite an effective little film. Solamente Nero, which came out a year after Profondo Rosso came out, hence the mm. title. Another mm. quite, a, quite an atmospheric little film. And there's a wonderful, mad little film made back in the 60s called The Monster of Venice, also known as the Embalmer, where a man dressed as a monk has a subterranean base where he abducts his victims. And if you ever want to see a man in a in a scuba diving costume dressed as a monk chasing a man through St. Mark's Square, I mean, there really is no no better film to start with. And there's no other film to start with. <laughs> there possibly isn't, you know. It's, it possibly isn't, yeah. I mean, there's a reason why, you know, maybe the makers of the film fail to understand that it shouldn't be difficult to run away from a man in a wetsuit, but... Um... Who saw her die, the first one that you mentioned? That's uh, the George Lazenby film, right? George Lazenby, who looks kind of unrecognisable. He, he took it very really... seriously, didn't he? he he's really kind of acting it. Yeah, he really, he's pretty good actually. Yeah, mm. yeah. I mean, he he lost a lot of weight after Bond. He looks very gaunt, very seventies, but he's he's really good in it. Yeah, he gives a proper performance in it. Maybe a little bit better than the film itself deserves, but um... well, maybe yeah, maybe so. Yes, <laughs> I, I'm always surprised that there aren't more films filmed in Venice because it just seems like such a you get such a bang for your buck in terms of you, you do. Yeah, I mean, I can only assume. 
Well, nowadays it would be expensive, I suppose. I mean, back in the 70s, I mean, uh, you know, the city was going through harder times, I suppose. Maybe it was cheaper to do in those days. There was that Kinski movie back in the 80s, Vampire in Venice, which, I mean, it's Klaus Kinski, Christopher Plummer, Donald Pleasance, and it is terrible. Um, mm. But it, it gives you good Venice, yeah. I remember seeing that on Channel 4, like, late late mm. at night sometime in the 90s and it's it's got some very dodgy young girls na- naked young girls really really on the borderline oh i mean kinski was an absolute pig on set by the, by the sound of it you know some of the stories about his behavior that you think well you know that you go to prison for that sort of thing but yeah it's uh... yeah ac- according to at least i think one of his daughters he was serially abusive yeah yeah i mean um you, you understand why uh, why the Native Americans in Fitzcarraldo actually offered to kill him, I suspect. <laughs> yeah, and, and why Werner Herzog was sorely tempted. Yes. <laughs> that's, that's one of the reasons I really wanted to talk to you as well, because you've got this real love of sort of vintage horror as well. Where, uh, where's that? When did that start? How did that start? Right. I think for people of my generation, it probably started with the um, the BBC Two double bills that they used to be on Saturday nights. And you'd, you'd start with maybe one of the old universal black and whites, and then there'd be a maybe a Hammer or an Amicus colour film after that. So the rite of passage, if you like, was first being allowed to stay up to watch the black and white one, and then maybe being allowed to stay up to watch the colour one as well. And they, they were just magical, you know. Around about the same time, there was the BBC adaptation of Dracula with Louis Jordan, which was tremendous. I mean, I still think it's, poss- it's, it's almost certainly the most accurate version of the book. And when I got a little bit older, on Saturday nights, there was uh, the Hammer House of Horror TV series. And that was the only thing people talked about in school on Monday morning was, did you see Hammer House of Horror? Yeah. I mean, it seemed incredibly incredibly strong stuff at the time. I mean, it was post-watershed entertainment, but again, you know, you'd beg your parents to be allowed to go to, to stay up and watch that. Yeah. I remember Hammer House of Horror and Tales of the Unexpected as well, sort of being two of those things that, that Monday, the Monday morning, what we would say today is water cooler uh, conversation. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think horror is particularly good at that. There was one movie that I always remember be, it being talked about again and again and again, uh, uh, to the point that when I actually saw it, I was waiting to be underwhelmed and, and actually wasn't, was um, Omen 2. Oh, that, yeah. Yeah, because there's a really elaborate death where someone a guy gets killed by being chopped in half by a, a oh the lift cable a lift cable yes yeah and I remember that being described to me and it, there's something about horror that people describe something to you and you think how can they have done that that that's um, uh, that that's impossible that's right you know? yeah yeah I mean the bit that gets me in Omen too is the guy under the ice mm. which is genuinely frightening I think I mean and and the, yeah the elevator cable death I mean you think that was yeah that was incredibly well done. I mean, I think in the, in the in the first omen, I mean, it's just a series of brilliant set pieces. Patrick Troughton being impaled by the spire from the church, David Warner's head. It's incredible. I think the story had that David Warner actually had had his own head for a while. Sorry, say again? <laughs> <laughs> the, the decapitated head, uh, which yeah. was not actually David oh, Warner's oh. actual head. Yes, apparently he actually had that at home for a while. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I see. I thought you were saying like, oh, no. I thought you were saying he actually got decapitated and he had to, oh. you know, had to keep it on. Yeah. I, was, I was so confused. That was, I could imagine, phew, that was a close one, yes. <laughs> that was COVID confusion right there. <laughs> I was like, Omen seems to belong to that school of horror, which nowadays exists in American movies like Final Destination, where it's really mm. based on a very elaborate set of, you know, how are we just going to kill these five exactly, or six? Exactly, yeah. You, you're waiting for the next big set piece, yeah. And you know, they're good at that, I think, yeah. In terms of the Italian horror, is that, you know, we, we already talked about Profundo Rosso, and, well, not talked about, but mentioned. When, when did you start getting into those? Yeah, that's a good question, because, I mean, back in the 80s, when I was starting to sort of, you know, collect books about old films and old horror films. And you'd see references to people like Mario Barber and Barbara Steele. Who is Barbara Steele? She's been in all these Italian films. You never got to see any of them because they were never on British telly. I think maybe Barber's Black Sunday was on once. And I think I saw The Cat of Nine Tales, Argento's second film on TV. But most of this stuff was just not turning up on mm. British television until maybe the last 20 years. Um, but then when you, you know, streaming services and YouTube and that started um, hosting this stuff, I realised there was this absolutely 
amazing genre of Italian, Italian horror cinema, which, I mean, some of it is just stupendous, I think. And that's when I got very heavily into Mario Bava and Argento and, you know, maybe a bit of Lucio Fulci and the whole ja- the whole giallo subgenre is fascinating. But it, t- it took a long while to find this stuff because it wasn't easily available. And, you know, yeah, I was living in Swansea and living in Tenby at the time. And, you know, Mario Bava was, was not well thought of in Swansea at that time. So. We've got a future guest coming on the podcast to talk about his biography of Bava, uh, which I think is due out in March. So that's oh, right. something who, for us who, to look forward. Uh, it's a guy called Leon Hunt. Right, right. I think I might have heard of this. Yes. Yeah, looking forward to that. Yeah, he's gonna. He's already sent me it to read, but uh, the publication oh, date yeah. is, a, is a little uh, ahead. Oh, lucky you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's one of the benefits, to tell you the truth, yeah. of doing podcasts. I'm getting <laughs> lots and lots of people sending me stuff, which is great. Keep it keep it coming guys what was your entry gate drug to italian horror then what was the sort of film that you i mean you've you've heard about it and you've read about it and what was the one that you watched that went whoa this is some this is this is on my wavelength yeah it was most certainly mario barber's black sunday right um which is kind of atypical because we do associate barber with these extraordinary colors and things like that it's the only movie he made with barbara Steele. Um, people tend to think she made a, a whole series of films with him, but actually it's her only one uh, with Barber. And I was just struck by how beautiful it looked. You could clip images from it and stick them on your wall, and they look absolutely gorgeous. And Steele looks amazing in it, you know, with those cheekbones and those big eyes. And it's pretty gruesome in parts as well. I mean, you're not staking people through the heart. No, you're going to stake them through the eye, because that's even more gruesome, isn't it? And then after that... Probably discovering Argento, probably with Cat and Nine Tales, which isn't his strongest film of that period, but then seeing Suspiria and just being blown away by you by the use of colour and the fact that does the plot make sense? Well, it kind of does, but it took me quite a long time to work out what it was. Um, but he just it was just something to get completely lost in. It was a movie you could get utterly completely lost in this mad, nightmarish fairy tale world. It's like, you know, a bad dream of a film. I mean that in a good way. I was watching it just the other day for its 45th anniversary, and it's it still has an impact on me from the very opening in the airport. And you know the, the opening tinkling chords of that score by Goblin, and it still has a great impact on me. Dario Argento, for me, was one of those filmmakers, much more so than Bava, but he was one of those filmmakers who I kind of had to learn to like, if you know what I mean. I had to sort of work out what he was doing before mm. I got into it. And I think it was very much related to that idea that you just said of the sort of dreamlike quality, that mm. if, if you approach it on a sort of like, you know, cold light of day logic then, yeah. it, 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 you know, you, you can be quite resistant to it, I think. Or at least I was. I mean, I'm talking about myself really here. But then when I watched Suspiria, cause it, so I watched Profondo Rosso, mm. and actually I was sort of sent it to review. Somebody said, you know, review mm. this for an for a, a internet site called Electric Sheep. And I um, and so I, I sat down to watch it, and I thought, well, it's kind of ugly, and it's kind of nasty and it's sadistic and I, I found it difficult to sort of find anything redeeming about it and then I watched Suspiria and then I went back and watched it and went mm. oh, okay, okay now I get it now I'm not it, it took me a while to get into Profondo Ross so I love it now I mean I, I think it's a romantic comedy with murders in <laughs> I, I, I genuinely think that relationship between David Hemmings and Daria Nicolodi I think it's utterly charming and I think I could imagine William Powell and Myrna Loy doing it sort of 30 years or 40 years previously only with, you know, fewer horrible axe murders and things like that. People get <laughs> women getting boiled to death. And oh, yeah. Yeah, that's horrible, isn't it? Yeah, that's the, that's the worst part, possibly. Yeah. Inferno as well has that same dream logic as Suspiria. Again, I, I've watched it and watched it and thought, I don't know if this makes sense, but just as a series of images, as pure cinema, it's extraordinary. Bava, he sort of, uh, I mean, he, he makes amazing horror movies, but he sort of also makes really good sort of science fiction film and he makes a later film, which is a sort of giallo in the sense of a, a police film, really, more a, a sort of kidnapping. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, what's it called? Is it called Strait? Is it Arabiati? Yeah, is exactly. It, yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. I'm not sure what the English title is. Angry Dogs. I don't know. Yeah, I suppose <laughs> it would be. But rabid, yeah, rabid Dogs, maybe. Yeah, so many of these are different titles, don't they? Yes. I mean, um, Bay of Blood, for example, which is basically Friday the 13th. It's known as Chain Reaction or the 
twitch of the death nerve and and such like yeah well i was going to say black mm. black sunday i think is black sabbath and mask of the demon isn't a, yeah. or are those different films because i know uh, yeah black sunday is the mask of the demon right uh the mascara del demonio black sabbath is trilogy a uh, trilogy of terror Ah, I think in okay. Italian, yeah. Right. So it, of those sort of, so you've got Argento and you've got Bava mm -hmm. and Fulci as well? I, I like some of Fulci's films. Mm. I think, and I don't want to, I know Fulci is a legion of dedicated fans out there. I think he was a lesser talent than Bava and Argento. He's, sometimes I just think this is too much. This is crazy. This is nuts. And sometimes it works really well. There's a, the, the beyond, I think it's it, E tu vivrai nel terrore. Uh, or the Aldila in Italian. There's some wonderful images in it. It's it's utterly grotesque at times, but possibly in a good way. His zombie film, of course, is kind of iconic. But there's also an awful lot of horrible stuff in there, like the New York the New York Ripper is just it's a, it's a film I've seen half of, and I've never seen the second half of it. He, he, yeah, he had a great eye, but I'm not sure he was a great director. Mm, I know what you mean. I, I sort of get that. I I haven't seen New York Ripper. That's one. That's oh, don't don't. It's not not worth it. It's awful. It's, right. it's, it's, it's profoundly misogynistic and it's just relentlessly unpleasant in a way that I just found tiresome after a while. Well, well what is it that you think a film has to have? Because, I mean, you know, there's some very strong images in Argento as well. Uh, what, what is it that it has to have to not make it just, you know, this is just horrid? I don't know. It's, it's yeah. Horrid. I'm with Mark Gatiss on this where he actually said for him there has to be a a beauty to a horror film. And mm. I very much agree with that. You know, if we're thinking back to James Whale or Val Luton or Murnau, you know, right back to the 20s, and then we think to, you know, Terence Fisher's Hammer films, Barbara and Argento, there is a beauty to all of them. It's a very macabre beauty at times, but um, it is there. And I think possibly in the best of Fulci's films, it's there as well. But I think, you know, in a lot of them, it just, for me, it just, they're just a bit ugly, I find, at times. I remember seeing one one of his films that I turned off halfway through, and I can't remember the title, but it's about a guy who's in a lot of gambling debt, and he's an, uh, he's played by an American actor, I think, and he kills this old woman, but it takes him ages to kill her, and yeah. he's got to put her head in the oven and cook her head and stuff like that. And yeah. it's just really, it's just like, oh, and it's meant to be a comedy. That's the, right. yeah. <laughs> that's the thing. Yeah. I mean, it's like there's a scene in the house by the cemetery where this guy's attacked by a vampire bat which latches onto his hand and he's stabbing at it again and again and again with a pair of scissors. And I'm just thinking, but well, bats are never the easiest creatures to show successfully on screen anyway, but he's flailing around with this bat and stabbing at it and stabbing at it. And how long is this bat going to take to die and what is going to be left of the guy's hand by the time he finishes with it? <laughs> but as you say, logic and sense. Uh, I mean, it's a little bit like the spaghetti westerns as well. It's, it's yeah, that sort of yeah. <laughs> heightened, dramatic. It, it doesn't belong to the world of realism, put it that no, way. No, it's like, I mean, there's a reason why, you know, Argento made two films set in the world of the opera. It's this very operatic sort of level of, of, of violence, yeah. I, I mean, just going back to something you said about the, the Mark Gattis quote about something mm. something of beauty, I was thinking, yeah, in, in terms of like the, the recent craze for folk horror dating back to The Wicker Man, which seems to become yeah. like a seminal film. I re-watched mm. The Wicker Man recently and it's... Uh, that's a beautiful film. I mean, that oh, looks, it is. looks gorgeous. It's tremendously well done. Uh, it looks amazing, you know, because of the uh, exactly that sort of natural setting, the remote island. It's a probably a career best performance by Christopher Lee. And it's just the remorseless logic of it, where you watch it the first time and you think, oh, wow, how's he going to get out of this one? And still up until the very end, you're thinking, you know, there'll be a police helicopter on the horizon now and he's going to be okay. And then it ends and you think, wow, he didn't make it. Spoilers, unfortunately, <laughs> um, but <laughs> for a 50-year-old film. And then you watch it again and you start thinking, oh, yes, the... the, the it's like a well put together watch in some ways where you, you see the machinery with the plot ticking over and think, oh, this is just very, very clever. I think that film is kind of spoiler proof. I, I agree. When I first watched it, I was absolutely gobsmacked by the mm. ending and like, I can't believe he's not rescuing a girl from there rather yeah, than himself. Yeah. He's mm -hmm. the girl. He's the virgin, yeah, you know? Yeah. But having watched it and then rewatched it yeah as soon as you know the ending it it, it makes even it's even more enjoyable just mm. sort of seeing his doom on on roll yeah from the same period have you seen blood on satan's claw yes very recently again mm. uh, that was that was quite a like 6 months ago i think yeah um yeah i uh, 
I mean, those all of those films of sort of soily, twiggy, nettily English horror, yeah. you know, that sort of folk horror, rural horror. I, I think they really work very well. You know? They do. I mean, I remember Piers Haggard saying that so often in Blood on Satan's Claw, he's shooting it near ground level as if to suggest that, you know, the, the earth itself, there's something wrong with it. Um, there's something unholy there. And there's a, a really real creeping atmosphere of dread and evil about that particular film, which I think works it works ever so well. I mean, you see the creature a little bit too much at the end, perhaps, but it's incredibly mm. effective, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think, yeah, revealing stuff is always problematic when you get to... Uh, Difficult, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, I mean, even sort of Ridley Scott in Alien, I think, had absolutely the right idea. And even mm. there, there were a couple of bits where he could have shown less of the alien. I think so, yes. No. Yeah, absolutely. I mm. think he, specifically there's a shot, I think it's when, is it Tom Selleck gets... Th- that's it, yeah. There's just a little bit too much of looks it. Like yeah. yeah. it. Looks like a guy. Looks like a guy. Yeah, and it is a guy in a suit, I think, at that point, isn't it? So, yeah, yeah. Night of the Demon is the one that people always disagree on. Do we need to see the demon or do we not need to see the demon? Mm. And I actually find it quite effective. I think, well, that's what demons look like. That's what they look like, you know, in old woodcuts and manuscripts and things like that. So I don't actually mind seeing it. If there is a problem with it, it's that we see it in the opening scene. Mm. And mm. so you're, 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 you're always aware, well, the demon's there, that it's out there. It's not just in the guy's head. Whereas if you just seen it at the end, I think you'd have thought, oh, wow, yeah, that looks pretty good. Yeah, that's, again, another sort of strange... I mean, that was, that must have been, like, early 60s? Early or nothing, late, late 50s, late I think. Late 50s? Late 50s, yeah. Oh, mm. That's a strong film for its time as well. Oh, it is, yeah. I mean, it's wonderful, and it's, you know... Jack Donner, it's wonderfully, wonderfully well made. When you were talking earlier as well about the classic sort of universals, when you'd have those double bills and you'd have a universal horror, I got the box set of the Monsters collection, the Frankenstein <laughs> and Bride of Frankenstein yeah. and everything. I, I love those films, but I'm never scared. <laughs> you know, there's that, there's no, that sort of thing. No. It's like a Christmas card version of horror where everything yeah. is there for the atmosphere, but I'm sort of watching them going... Mm. Yeah, I, and... Likewise, to be honest, I think I think some of them are are wonderful, but they don't scare me anymore. Um, I do remember seeing um, the first one I ever saw was the Karloff version of The Mummy, uh, directed by Karl Freund, and I would probably have been about 10, but there was one image in that which did scare me, and it wasn't The Mummy Awakening, it's just Karloff after he's basically, well, unwrapped himself, if you like, and there's yeah. this very effective makeup job on him. And Freund suddenly just cuts straight into his eyes, which seem to be glowing. And it's just his face filling the screen with these glowing eyes. And at the age of 10, that did actually shake me a bit. Yeah. Yeah. But sadly now, I mean, um, I wish they could. Ha- I almost wish they could have the same effect as they might have had on me when I was a small boy. And sadly, they don't. But... I mean, I wonder at the time if they were, because of course they're being made under, under different, I don't know if the pr- production code probably hadn't come in quite yet, but certainly a certain sense of restraint let's say so i'm not i'm not even sure if they're necessarily sort of intending to be much more than chilling yeah i mean it was famously the black cat caused a bit of a stir mm. um i mean oh. and, and that was pre that was pre code and the the ending where Karloff is flayed alive by the ghost it's you don't see any of that but you kind of see Karloff writhing in silhouette on this cross-shaped sort of scaffold. And that, I imagine, would have been strong stuff for its time, yeah. Yeah, that's uh, no, I found that I found that probably the scariest of those early films. And Almost so, certainly, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, what film, because I think I've talk, I talked to a lot of sort of horror fans, horror aficionados, and I'm always interested about that very subjective thing of being scared because i think there can be sometimes if you watch especially if you watch a lot of horror films you sort of become like the sommelier who you know who <laughs> who can't who can't enjoy cheap plonk anymore uh, yeah you know? yeah what, what's what sort of thing really scares you or or, or even now even even today god that's a good question um i think it is just perhaps just the sense of isolation and of being alone and then of realizing that you're not alone and then there's something else there and you can't see it. It's always just kind of out of your peripheral vision. And I think somebody like Val Luton was very good at that when he worked with people like Tourneur and Cat People, for example. I think, again, in Argento's best films, that sort of nightmare logic and trapped in dream, but not being able to wake up, that's a very, uh, that's a very powerful feeling, I think. And I think a lot of that 70s satanic horror, yeah, a lot of that made a big impression on me at the time. The first Omen, for example, 
The Exorcist, I still think there's a great, there's an enormous power to that film in many ways. But really, I think it's, um, and I'll go back to Night of the Demon here, where um, Peggy Cummins reads a bit from um, The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, like one that on a lonesome road that walk in fear and dread. And I think the best bit is what follows. And having once turned round, looks back and turns no more his head. And it, yeah, <laughs> just that feeling, especially in a city like Venice, walking down a narrow street late at night, maybe the fog's rising, and wondering what you would see if you turned around. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about Don't Look Now then, because that's the uh, that's <laughs> yeah. the, the, the sort of, I mean, mm. I think it was voted a few years ago, it was voted sort of the best, the best British film par yeah. excellence, you know, Absolutely. Not, not, yeah. not a horror yeah. film, but just in... Mm. Um, what's your relationship to that movie? Um, I first saw it probably in uh, the late 80s. I think it was on television, probably watching it with my parents. Then they got to that to that scene between Donald Sutherland and Julie Christie, and I thought, no, please, please, <laughs> please make it stop. Please make it stop. <laughs> yeah, my mum probably said, well, I'll go and make a cup of tea if anyone else like that. It's and funny it, how that scene goes on much longer when you're watching it with your mum compared to does, if you're watching it on it, your own. It, it never ends. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I, I didn't really get it. I think I was too young to actually understand that, you know, I was just waiting for sort of, you know, people walking along spooky streets and spooky red figures jumping out at them. I think I was too young to, uh, to really appreciate it. What, what is the horror in it? I mean, it's the, the horror is... The expression on Donald Sutherland's face as he pulls his little girl out of the pond, I mean, it, this is, it's awful to watch, you know. I mean, it's, it's so brilliantly performed. And the look of absolute anguish and horror on his face is extraordinary. And then you start to notice other little things like the motif of red that goes through the, through the film, the figure in church on that still that Sutherland is looking at in the very opening scene, the way Rogue kind of uses that because the colours are all kind of muted apart from the reds throughout. And I think the more I've seen it, the more I've, I've really started to appreciate it. Um, there was a restored version uh, shown in Venice a couple of years ago. Um, and um, it was, it must have been during, yeah, 2020 it would have been because uh, we'd emerged from lockdown, but they were showing it outdoors and everybody had to distance. And of course, it was the one night in about three months where it hammered it down with rain. But um, seeing it on the, a decent version on a big screen, and I thought, yeah, this is this is wonderfully well done. There's a real emotional heart to it. It's it's tragic. It really is. I mean, it's um, and again, the logic where it, where it, the way it unveils itself, where you think, ah, no, it's 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 about Sutherland. It's not about Christie. Yeah, it's it's about his his journey. Yeah. It's, it's it's tremendous. Again, it doesn't really scare me. Maybe I've seen it too often now. Yeah, no, I hmm, hmm. it's difficult to to say if I'm scared of it now. Mm. But it it certainly creeps me out, and that ending creep is 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 incredibly freaky. Yeah, um, you still have to brace yourself for that. I think. Yeah, mm, yeah. Uh, but the fact mm. that you can brace yourself is a little bit <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. of a relief, I guess. I yeah, I I'm. It's definitely up there for me. I think my first time I ever saw it was uh, when Alex Cox showed it on Movie Drone. Oh right, yeah, yeah. As as with many 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 great yeah, I mean, films. Yeah, yeah. He showed The Wicker Man. Um, I think I think it was the very first one, in fact, wasn't it? Yeah, could well have been. I mean, I actually went on the internet a few months ago and sort of got the list of Movie Drone films so I could get any one any that I'd missed and I was looking through them going no I watched all of these yeah oh it was tremendous wasn't it I electric glide yeah. and blue yeah yeah <laughs> tons of them uh that really early Willem Dafoe film where he's in a motorcycle gang oh what's the title of that um irredeemable or something the un yeah, it's some adjective about how <laughs> bad they are. Yeah, no, I mean, I the other thing I think about uh, Don't Look Now is I think you could give it to any sort of film class to teach movies mm. because I just yeah. think it's technically so... He's such a great storyteller as a, as a from a cinematic point of view. Uh, he's telling the story via editing and via color. Absolutely, it's kind of like a masterclass in that, isn't it? Uh, to go back as well to to your own writing and your own sort of setting stuff in Venice, he definitely shows a Venice which is not the postcard. It's not Saint Saint Mark's Square. You know, I think the first thing you hear Donald Sutherland say. When, when the film transitions out of the prologue from England, is a tutto marcio. It's all rotten. It, it is. And actually, Venice in the films of, of that period 
it doesn't it doesn't look lovely mm. it always looks broken down and dirty and crumbling away uh you know, the ones i mentioned earlier again and Chi la vista morire. There's a set in the Molino Stucchi, which is now a posh hotel. And at the time, it was just a wreck. You know, it was overgrown. It was an overgrown mill. But the city looks grimy. Yeah, it's mm. not a lovely place at all. Uh, even mm. at the end, when uh, again spoilers for Don't Look Now, when they're <laughs> going into the church at the end with the funeral, there's just yeah. a huge pile of rubbish bags, just an absolutely enormous pile of rubbish. And you can imagine that's intentional. You can't, you know. It would have cost him nothing to say, OK, I, I want that out of the shop, you know, come and, come and take it away. I mean, in, in some ways, you think, well, why did they go there? I mean, yeah, I know he had the job at the church, but, you know, your daughter has just died and you go somewhere with a sense of decay and death is almost tangible. It's, um, yeah, yeah. And, you, and your daughter died, died drowning and you go to... Yeah, yeah, it's got a city based on water, yeah. I mean, isn't that a little bit of a horror trope, though? Um, like the Roy Scheider character in Jaws going to going to an island and not liking water. It's just like you... Yeah, I suppose that's it, isn't it? Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You've got to trap your character with his internal demons. You, J- Jack Nicholson, who is quite obviously mad from the off, goes and takes a job in a hotel miles and miles and miles from civilization. Yes, and yes. he's so obviously a terrible writer as well. Oh, yes. <laughs> no, no play in all work makes Jack a dull boy. I mean, he's going to read that. That's just... it's, an experiment. it's an experimental work, I suppose, yes. <laughs> it's, it's his Finnegan's Wake. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> but I love the fact that there's absolutely no evidence that he's ever written anything before. No. Nothing at no, no. I'm working on my third novel. It's not. Yeah. It's like, uh, do you find The Shining scary? I love it. Uh, I think it's immensely powerful and it's wonderful to look at. And I could just watch it over and over again. I don't know if I find it scary. Maybe I did the first time. You know, actually wondering what was going on. Um, the old woman in the bathtub, the blood or whatever it is pouring out of the lift shafts, the spooky kids. Yeah, the first time I imagine it, I imagine uh, I probably did. I saw that re- re-released about two years ago again, and I just thought, I love this. I think this is great, but it's not really scaring me anymore. Mm. Oh, this is all rather sad, isn't it? <laughs> I've not got to that point. I mean, I with The Shining, I, I never found it particularly scary, and then I watched it on the big screen. It was probably, it was a, a very fortunate to, to see it at Cannes when they did, did the sort of special screening and they had Stanley Kubrick's daughter came, and it was, oh, it was amazing. Mm. Quaron, uh, I've, I've Alfonso Cuaron, uh, yeah, the Mexican, mm-hmm. the Mexican director of Gravity and Children mm-hmm. of Men, and his, and I found that sitting and watching it in a big screen with a room full of people was actually the most frightening I'd ever experienced it. It just wow, gosh, just because of the soundtrack and and the size of the images and the way you were you know in that maze and you're in that hotel, yeah, uh, and rather than being claustrophobic, which it. it Kubrick does one of those counterintuitive things of he makes the hotel massive. So you're not claustrophobic, yeah. you're agoraphobic. It's actually too big for you. Everybody's dwarfed in it. Everybody's, Absolutely, you know, yeah. The little boy on his trike is just as tiny as the adult. One other uh, Italian director I'd like to ask you about is Ruggiero Deodati. What, what, what's your take on his work? Whoa, I honestly haven't seen very much. Um, right. I, I haven't seen, uh, is it Cannibal Holocaust is... Is is the biggie, isn't it? Yeah, I, I genuinely haven't seen that. It's one of those films where I think, would I actually watch this? I mean, it's the fact that you know the uh, the real life cruelty to animals and stuff is, yeah, I'd have issues with that, I suspect. So I actually haven't seen anything by him. Yeah, I think I remember the, the one of the DVD releases that they did. They actually did have options. Do you want the? Do you want the animal cruelty version? Yeah. Oh yes, also like yeah, that's a white weird thing, isn't it? Yes, yeah, yeah. What what what, what sort of monster would you have to be to say yeah, I'm going to watch that? Yes. <laughs> so so I, I haven't actually I haven't actually seen it with you. Oh, yeah, I've seen Cannibal Holocaust, and it's it's not a film I would I would recommend. But it is extremely effective. I mean, not mm. not a film I would recommend just simply because I wouldn't want to be responsible for someone sort of being upset. Because <laughs> you know? mm. um, it is it is gruesome, and it just has a gruesomeness all the way through it. It's mm. sort of drenched in in ickiness and and. Yeah snuff film vibes and in fact Diodati was um had a huge court case in Milan 
where he was accused of of having murdered people, partly because of the publicity, because they're to do the advertising, they didn't get any of the actors to do interviews because they wanted it to mm. be like they disappeared, you know, Blair, yeah. Blair Witch style, because it's a found footage <laughs> film. Yeah, yeah. And some people said, okay, this is a snuff film and the prosecutor in Milan, and they had to sh- he had to show how yeah. he'd made certain shots. I think there was a similar case with Fulci, was it after... Um... Lizard in a Woman's Skin, which actually is a really good film. Um, and there were some dismembered dogs in it or such like. And again, they had to get the special effects guy to to demonstrate that, you know, these these were not actual dogs who were who were harmed during filming. But Yeah, I mean, sometimes I wonder if there's also a little bit of the publicity guy behind the scenes. Uh, almost, almost certainly, yeah. yeah. This will really boost the film <laughs> if we have a, mm. a, a couple of thousand... <laughs> Euros in lawyers, and then uh, we got millions worth of publicity. There's probably some people listening to this who haven't seen any Italian horror at all. What would you What would you recommend they they sort of start with? I would say it depends very much on your tastes. If you do have a taste for the Gothic, then either Barber's Black Sunday or Black Sabbath. They're both wonderful. If for the more crime related elements, um, Argento's first. Um, the Bird of the Crystal Plumage is a, it works as a brilliant crime thriller, like a Hitchcockian thriller, as well as it works as a horror film. Tenebrae is fascinating. It's ever so well made. His use of colour in that, or use of the lack of colour in that. And my goodness me, Tenebrae never gets boring. There's a murder about every 10 minutes, and it's just the, the inventiveness, you know, it's like he's thinking, how many ways can I think of to kill somebody spectacularly and operatically? Um, the the razor blade murder where you see the blade going through the light bulb. Mm. Um, I mean, I just watched and re-watched that and just thought, this is just so well done. This is ever so clever. So I'd say if you like the Gothic, go back to Barber's Black Sunday or Black Sabbath or, oh my goodness me, Kill Baby Kill, which is a terrible title for a wonderful film. Um, it's called Operazione Paura in Italian. It sounds like a spy film. It's not. Mm. It's a high gothic piece. Fellini might have been influenced by it when he shot his segment of Spirits of the Dead. But that's a beautiful, beautiful looking film. And if, of course, if, if, if gore is your thing, well, you know, Ful- Fulci is never, ever going to let you down on that score. You know, his zombie film is... is iconic. I've still never worked out, how did he do the shark scene in Zombie, where you actually, you have a zombie fighting a shark, and like, that's that's a real shark, surely, that's, it's, how did he do that? It's got to have, like, sort of chain mail underneath or something and be a, a, a sh- shark guy. But, but the shark guy, I mean, this guy's an extra, he's probably only getting a couple of bob a day, and it's like, you know, what what's my role in this? What's my motivation? Well, you're fighting a tiger shark. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so where, where's where's the stunt shark? Well, we don't actually have one of those, we, but this one will be fine. Yeah. I'm just going to sick a shark on you. <laughs> <laughs> crazy guy, crazy guy. My my interesting shark fact is the the guy who invented the snow in It's a Wonderful Life died was eaten by a shark filming a movie called Shark Attack. Really? Yeah, yeah. Right. Same same wow. special effects guy. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Um... If I if I was telling you this. A year ago, I would remember his name as well, but I, uh, mm. I can't remember it now. It's but... probably quite easy to Google. There can't be many people who have uh, <laughs> ended that. Yeah. Have you never been tempted to, or or have you sort of bled this into your own fiction writing, or have you ever thought I'd really love to do a pure sort of horror gothic? In, yeah. In all honesty, I I don't know if the sort of horror that I like reading. I don't know if there's much of a market for that these days. The sort of the M.R. Jamesy and Arthur Mackin style of, of horror. I, I don't know how much of a market there is for that these days. And I honestly don't know if I've got it in me to, to write like that. Uh, my fourth crime novel, Venetian Gothic, I suppose, is, is the closest I've come to that. And I'm, you know, playing around with finding empty graves on the cemetery island and setting scenes on the ossuary island of San Dariana and things like that. And that's probably the closest I've got to it. I, I do put a couple of in-jokes into every book in terms of character names and things like that. And if people spot them, that's, you know, that that's nice. I mean, there's, there, there's an investigative reporter in one of my books called Gianni Brezzi, who is named after Gianna Brezzi, which was Daria Nicolodi's character in Profondo Rosso. And she just died, so I thought, oh, I'll, so I changed the name as a sort of little tribute and things like that. Mm. But in terms of doing a pure horror novel, um, 
I don't know. I don't know if I've got it in me, to be honest. Mm. I'd probably write something and people would say, well, this kind of thing went out with H.P. Lovecraft or something like that. I do have a fan who keeps encouraging me to write a Lovecraftian horror set in Venice, which is <laughs> one of these days. Yeah. It's so funny. Lovecraft's a mark, far more effective at adjectives than he is a writer. I mean, I think, I think his, uh, the atmosphere of Lovecraft is, is really good. The actual stories and books of Lovecraft, not so much. Yeah, he never met an adjective he didn't like, did he? <laughs> um, yeah, when he's at his best, it's tremendously good. I think at the Mountains of Madness is, a, yes. is, is terrific. Charles Dexter Ward is terrific. But there are quite a lot of his short stories. Well, here he'll use the word give us perhaps a little too, <laughs> a little too, too often or he'll overload it with adjectives. Um, I, oh, love, I, do, I do enjoy him. Yeah. I love the way his um, his twists at the end are always so obvious, and yet he sort of <laughs> delivers them as if it's like... As if you, you're never going to guess what's happening here. <laughs> the monster, yeah. right? The monster, mm. it's you! That's the... <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I got that from paragraph mm. one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I got it from the title. Yes, yes. I looked in the mirror, and yes, the reflection was, yes... <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah. uh, and and in terms of sort of like the, the books and, that you've written already, have you got any interest in turning those into something sort of dramatic, or cinematic or televisual? Oh, that would be lovely. I mean, they're all they're on audio, which is nice. And that's as far as I expected them to go. We did have some interest um, from a TV company in, in Germany. And it, I think it was probably the wrong time. The books hadn't come out in Germany. At that point, I think if we waited a couple more years, maybe they might have gone for it. But um, you never know. It would be nice, obviously. It would be nice to see. And at the same time, I'd probably think, oh, I didn't really imagine Nathan looking like that. But um, <laughs> I, 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 I'd get over that. I'd get over that. Yeah. <laughs> Who's in your head as Nathan Sutherland then? Who, who, would, who would you cast? David Tennant would be terrific, I think. Or if I... not that, Michael Sheen um because he's terrific and he can do anything but of course they're both working on good omens together so it's uh, yeah <laughs> yeah either of those i'd be delighted when i was a kid i used to read books i always used to cast them in my head as i was oh reading i still them. do that i absolutely <laughs> do that yeah um yeah if, if i if it was reading a, a horror novel then yeah i could pretty i could be pretty sure that peter cushing or christopher lee would turn up in my head at some point and you know american noir humphrey bogart's going to be there at some point and yeah i still do that yeah <laughs> so speaking of reading film books what's your uh, what would your recommended film book be my recommended book right um jonathan rigby put out a trilogy over a period of years american gothic english gothic and euro gothic and they are all tremendous but i would really recommend euro gothic as an introduction to the Euro horror genre. It's it's incredibly comprehensive. It's obviously a labor of love. It's immensely readable. And my goodness me, I've learned so, I came up with this massive list of films that I just wanted to watch after reading it. So I can very highly recommend Jonathan Rigby's Euro Gothic. Brilliant, that's superb. I haven't, I've not read that, so I, I, shall, uh, I shall add that to my, my incredibly <laughs> long list of, of stuff to read. Um, listen, Phil, thanks so much for, for your time. That's been a pleasure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's been it's been really good fun talking to you. Good, and I hope we can do this in real life once you're out of quarantine. So So that was my conversation with Phil. I hope you enjoyed it. I certainly did. There was lots of interesting stuff there. His recommended book was Jonathan Rigby's... Well, he, he kind of recommended the series American Gothic, English Gothic, and Euro Gothic, but it was the last one that he particularly underlined, and that will be the first book on my list. Um, and I'm... Uh, yeah, I'm going to maybe reach out to Jonathan and see if he wants to come on as a guest. Now, as I said at the beginning of the podcast, I'd like to go over to my, my friends in Norway. Norway. The first one is Lucas Knapp, who is a Polish journalist, and uh, yeah, uh, let, let me, without further ado, uh, let me let me see what his recommended book is. Okay, so we're on the road in Norway with Lucas Knapp, who is a uh, Polish writer on film. He writes widely, and he's also got his own YouTube channel, uh, which is called Knapp on... <laughs> it's Knappa Knappa. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, like uh, 
Knapp is my surname and uh, Kanapa is uh, couch in Polish, so it's like my Knapp's couch, oh, okay. literally, so yeah. So it works, it works better in Polish. But, yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah, it's, it's definitely Polish uh, proper uh, YouTube channel names. <laughs> what are you, what, how are you enjoying your, this is your first trip to Norway as well? I love it so far, you know, I'm used to be a South country lover, I just came back from Fuerteventura when I was surfing and now I'm here so it's like really mindfuck <laughs> a little bit so but I love it so far it's white and fresh and it's really like uh, my eyes are really wide open yeah yeah it's absolutely from one extreme to another yeah yeah no, I love it actually like I love the contrast and yeah. um, so have you got a favorite book for us a book on film uh, I do actually. One of my first books that I read during my film studies at the University of Derby uh, was David Bordwell's book on Ozu. It's uh, called uh, Ozu and the Poetics of Cinema. And I remember the book, actually it was, uh, I didn't know uh, any film about, uh, Ozu's film when I read the book. So. Uh, before I watched my first Ozu's film, I uh, read actually book and wow, the the, the book uh, is I, I think it's uh, like exemplary book on uh, the film author David Bordwell's uh, um, style of writing is uh, very clear, very exact, uh, very precise, and uh, I love how he, he actually uh, presents like the author's work. I mean you don't get to uh, learn much about uh, Ozu himself but you get to know everything about his style and actually he puts uh, his films in the variety of contexts uh, context of uh, Japanese culture, context of international distribution, uh, uh, Japanese culture uh, as well and uh, love it, I mean it's very ref refreshing uh, book and you, and you quite like uh, you like a lot of Bordwell's other work as well, right? Yeah, of course. I mean, you have like his uh, classic uh, book about film style. So, um, so yeah, uh, David Bordwell's an amazing author. I, I'd love to actually hear you talking with David Bordwell. I I'm sure he will agree, he would agree. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that'd be great. Yeah, I think that's a good suggestion for the future. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, I also had the opportunity to uh, meet up once more with friend of the podcast, Kaleem Aftab, and we talked about recommended books. Okay, Kaleem. Uh, Kaleem Aftab, we're in Norway, we're, we're on the road uh, going south from Tromsø. Um, uh, can you just no, tell us... No. no, we're going south. Are we going south? Yeah. Oh, the that's, where the, that's where the fjord is. Um, uh, just tell us for a second uh, what you can see out the window. Uh, I can see, I guess it's a fjord with uh, water, but it's so misty it's hard to see. There is some beautiful trees which are straight out of your favorite uh, noir Scandi TV series. They look perfectly leafless and twig friendly I don't know what they are actually but they're very tall and skinny good for this weather and then uh, a lot of snow and it's snowing heavily brilliant and uh, I'm just gonna ask you about your favorite film books of course you've been on the podcast before so uh, we, we won't ask you for those recommendations but I think you've got two film books you want to tell us about uh, I really like this book on filmmaking by Alexander McKendrick who made one of my favorite films of all time Sweet Smell of Success uh, for me if you're a movie director or you want to know about how to make a film in a very classical fashion uh, this is the Bible he really goes through all the shots tells you some of the terms that directors will use tells you about composition wide mid close-ups when he thinks you should use them obviously he worked at a time where handheld was not really in fashion so it's uh, very classical in many ways um, but it's the basics and I think it's a bit like Picasso 
he knew how to draw pictures amazingly that were still lifes and replicas of uh, landscapes but when he really um, so you need to know those basics before you can uh, really play about with them okay brilliant and I th I'm actually thinking of doing an episode with Paul Cronin just entirely on that book because I think he's he's working on it uh, he's working on several books about Alexander McKendrick at the moment and your second book I mean I have a few books actually which is not just to say it's, imagine, it's interesting you mention uh, Paul Cronin because his uh, Herzog on Herzog is probably the best interview book I've ever read um, the the anecdotes from Herzog are great. The research that Cronin has clearly done and the effort he's put in to ask the right questions is uh, exemplary. And he's an all-round nice guy, so that all works, so that's great. Um, I've mentioned on the podcast the semi-biography, uh, autobiography, something like a biogra uh, not biography, sorry, by uh, Akira Kurosawa, which is something like a biography, which is interesting because it doesn't really deal with his career but it's about the things in his personal life that really pushed him in the direction to make the kind of films that he did the injustices he felt his love of uh, martial arts is really clear he talks about um, wanting to go and work with his teacher he also had a father who was very disciplinarian um, but it's written in that, you know, Japanese style of like Murakami, which is full of melancholy and the tone really fits Kurosawa. It's a mix of like that where the melancholy meets drama in a big way. And I really like it. I think that's a great book. Um, I also, when I was younger, I read A Cinema of Loneliness and that was an influence on me now whereas I think now if I read it again I might read it again I think I won't like it so much yeah I've got it on the shelf uh, this is uh, the book about Arthur Penn and Coppola and those sort of new Hollywood yeah. uh, stars yeah. it's like a new Hollywood book and it's about alienation but it's alienation maybe today I will look at it differently because I seem to recall it's alienation from a very wide perspective and uh, the 70s New Hollywood was from that and it did create a lot of great underworld characters but um, it wasn't doesn't really deal with class in the way I would maybe like it to um, it deals with great shot making and how you can relay alienation in a really good way but I think the analysis of characters is quite uh, myopic in, in many ways yeah, yeah, it's it's definitely of its time. Uh, when I reread it recently, uh, yeah, it, it you do notice those, those sort of failings if 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 you want to uh, look at it in that way. Okay, uh, one more. Oh, one more. Okay, uh, it's also another Japanese biography, which is uh, I can never remember in my head if it's uh, Takeshi versus Kitano or Kitani versus Takeshi, <laughs> <laughs> which way it is. Um, but it's a splendid book. Uh, written in a great style i read oh, this is someone who would be interested for your podcast because i read that the author of that book whenever he watched a film even if he wanted to watch a scene halfway through he would always re-watch the film from the beginning oh that's interesting yeah that's that, that's a time consuming but but uh, a kind of purist approach it's very purist he yeah. believes like uh, every time he watched a film he'd pick up something else and when he reached the scene he will be able to talk about it in a more nuanced way um, and I find that fascinating but wow yeah time-consuming <laughs> as hell good uh, a good philosophy in the age of video cassettes not so much these days yeah absolutely oh, thanks very much Colleen appreciate it you're welcome and finally Anders Emblem the uh, director film director Norwegian film director of a wonderful film called A Human Position uh, and so we, he had this to say in regard to his favourite film book. I've been very uh, dried up the last years. Right, right. <laughs> but uh, now I got a few new books. I got the Florida Project book and uh, the Dragon Inn book. Right, right. Those two sh I should try and get to. Read, Are those so. also like little monographs, sort of? Um, the Sean Baker one is um, uh, now the Florida Project one is the writer is J. J. Murphy, I think. Right, right. And he wrote a book a long time ago that's called 
me and you and Memento and everyone or something like that. Oh right. It's about screenwriting in independent films. Mm. And that book has been very helpful for me when I started thinking about uh, making films. Well, yeah, that's actually my question is sort of like if you were to recommend a film book. That's it. That would be the one. Okay, yeah, could yeah. you give us a bit of a uh, It's been a while since I, re I read it, but it sort of <clears throat> it takes um is it 10 independent films mm -hmm. and it sort of breaks them down into this the screenwriting part of it. It's a bit weird because none of them are specifically screenplays per se. Mm. They're always very, uh, you have to see them with the directing. But I think it just shows that you can do whatever you want. You mm. just have to uh, do what feels right. And maybe it helps people to say, you can do it this way, you can do it this way and this way. And, and the introduction and the sort of the epilogue uh, chapters is the ones I read the most because it's just, I don't know, he's so good at writing about it and it's really inspired and directly inspires images when I read right. this books and uh, other film theory books and stuff like that. Excellent, brilliant, okay, great. Okay, so that's uh, that's all for this week. Um, I hope you enjoyed the episode, a little bit different this week, so I hope you enjoyed mixing it up a little bit. Um, Thank you very much to Elliot Atkins for the music, Ali Howard for the art, and thank you all for listening. I really do appreciate it. Please come back again for the next episode next week. Bye.